If you've seen my previous videos, you know about Derive. It's my 13.6 kilogram combat robot that recently competed at the Australian Feather Open Nationals, controlling opponents with its lifting forks and spinning discs. It's the subject of discussion again, as he's slated to compete at the Sportsman Nationals very soon. Compared to open combat where basically anything goes, the Sportsman rules dictate a robot cannot have high kinetic energy spinners or passive wedges. The idea is to avoid the big stick versus thick armor battles that most of open combat distills down to, and allow for more unique and perhaps fragile designs a fair chance. As for Derive, it was designed with this in mind, being primarily a lifter, so could compete as a sportsman if just removing the spinning disc, but with all the weight gained from that, there was room to upgrade for the lifter to be more dynamic. Sketch is an older 150 gram robot of mine that is a combined grabber-lifter mechanism. It is very effective at manipulating opponents, including parading them around the arena. The mechanism works off a single motor. The lifting forks are not directly powered by the motor, but rely on the top jaw getting stuck to actuate. As the first gear turns, the jaw closes, eventually stopping on top of the target. At this point, the two gears effectively stop being gears, and just pass the driving torque through this pin, which then lifts the forks. While simple and pretty effective, the disadvantage is that the grabbing force is proportional to the weight of the opponent, so it's possible they can wiggle free. Some grabbers have a separate actuator for the jaw to prevent this. With that, the task was to implement this mechanism onto the bigger robot. Unlike Sketch, the featherweight will use machined aluminium gears instead of 3D printed ones, as they don't expect plastic to handle the forces involved. As for machining the gear, there are three competing factors. Gear module or size, end mill diameter, and gear thickness. For some size of gear, the machining end mill has to be smaller than the smallest internal radius, which is typically the root of the tooth. But some end mill can only machine material so thick. My gears have a root fillet radius of 2mm, so are machinable with a 4mm end mill. My 4mm end mill can only slot cut to about 12mm deep, which is much thinner than I wanted the gear to be to ensure its strength. Therefore, both the gears and the grabber head will be made out of three pieces machined separately. 10 millimeters thick each. This sprocket and chain will send torque to this gear, which drives the gear teeth on the grabber jaw, which rides on this axle, which will lift the forks once the grabber head has caught a target. It's worth noting that the sprocket driving the gears is also aluminium and a lot thinner, but can handle the same amount of torque. This is due to the chain engaging with many teeth and spreading the load, whereas an involute spur gear like ours only engages a single tooth at a time. Other changes include bigger drive motors, idler pulleys with ball bearings instead of just grease, and extra top armour to handle overhead attacks. With the plan in place, it was time to prepare to arrive for rework. This was the first good look at the robot I've had since its event, and everything was bent or malformed. Uh, these threads, I didn't make those. The frame bolts are bent. The frame itself was even more bent. Bolt holes were no longer even remotely circular, and all of this was alongside the completely ruined spinner assembly. But most critically of all were the drive frame rails. Both the outer and inner rails had warped somewhat, though the outer rails can be blamed on my poor design where the motor bolts went through. Either way, many things had to be remade. Redesigning the outer rails for the different motors got rid of the very thin section, and not fully pocketing the weight saving features should help keep dirt out of the robot. These were the first new parts to make. I do apologise for any glare in the footage. It's hard to film shiny aluminium parts under artificial lighting.
Soon enough, we had two assembled drive pods. These used new Maytec 5065 motors to replace the Flipsky 5045 ones. The old drive drove fairly well, but was a little sluggish on reactions. The drivetrain has little gearing, so while the power is there, peak torque is lacking. Hopefully the much new and more punchy motors should up the twitchiness. To fit these new motors, I had to machine flats into the shafts to interface the D-bore pulleys. This is a bit of a harrowing process. I cover the motors in tape to keep the, out the debris, and mill manually. Once assembled, it was the usual desk tuning and troubleshooting, then set down for a drive test. Now for making the grabber. The gears and head are machined from the aforementioned 10mm aluminium and cleaned up manually. Then the axle of the head pivots on. It's turned from aluminium at the moment but was later changed to steel as I was worried about the strength given it transmits full lifter force through it. To ensure proper tolerance I checked the fitment in the lifter fork, but astute viewers may have noticed this is not the hole the axle sits in in the model. Nonetheless, we forge on with tapping the ends of the axle for the retaining fasteners, and the whole mechanism is assembled. Things fit well enough to disassemble and make properly, with correct materials and fitment. New mounting blocks should help keep the chain tension properly, as it always had a lot of slack. They are first profile cut, then put upright to bore the bolt holes. One can see in the G-code how the tool spirals downward to make the bore with an end mill smaller than the hole's diameter. I also learnt that, shocker, the old main lifter axle was also bent, but not enough to worry. The new lifter blocks did help improve chain tension. More reassembling followed towards a machine that was now actually fairly complete. It was now ready to test the grabber lifter mechanism. You don't want to be like stuck and then you do that. Wow. Can't even stay upright. Bye, bye, bye. 
I didn't throw around the robot as to not damage it, with the owner just nearby, but safe to say the mechanism has the torque to handle it no problem. Around about now, I noticed the drivetrain was not sitting flat, so rocking on two wheels. After placing it on a bench, it became obvious that the whole frame was, you guessed it, bent. Minor adjustment ensued. Nice robot, dude. <laughs> Back at home, attention was turned towards the idler pulleys in the drivetrain. They are currently steel on steel bushings with grease, which led to all sorts of problems at the time. So with hindsight, they were modified to take ball bearings. This matters much more than it may seem, as when the drive motor puts torque down to move forward, the radial force on the idler is increased. One can translate this to a weight force, and the steel on steel having some amount of friction, as if it were being a sled, dragged across the ground. So with a high force, the losses due to this resistance are pretty high, and only go up the more power one puts down. Ball bearings are like adding wheels to the sled, literally, and don't increase the rolling resistance with increased weight to any noticeable degree. The new pulleys turned out quite nice and had a noticeable effect on the driving of the robot, much less sticky. When working on the drivetrain to replace these, I noticed that, if you would be so convinced, one of the wheel axles was bent. It was quite a quick job to turn up a new one though. Getting towards completion, the polycarbonate hammer armors were milled out of 3mm sheet. I used a small end mill for these, even though a larger one was on hand. While it reduced cutting speed, the upward forces on the stock are also reduced, making it easier to clamp down the flexible sheet. They came out as perhaps the cleanest polycarbonate parts I've ever cut, so I will continue to do this going forward. Another job was machining steel teeth for the jaw. A simple mild steel job. A facing operation removed the top layer of mill scale to avoid having to sand that off. On the HMI side of things, this event would include trialling a new transmitter. Instead of the twin stick style I've been using up until now, we're moving towards a pistol radio akin to what is used in RC cars. These have the advantage of a greater range of motion on the driving inputs, leading to greater precision as well as combining the two into suitable throttle and steering controls. The grand problem is controlling anything else, as both hands are taken up driving. A quick print and modification moves a small joystick to under the user's thumb. This will be used to control the grabber. The new transmitter and drivetrain then got a final test on a slick concrete floor. While there will be a few growing pains, I do reckon these pistol radios have potential for robots that don't need a hand dedicated to controlling the weapons. I'll be leaving my usual transmitter at home, to force me to get used to the new radio. And that's where Derive sits in preparation for its upcoming event. Sportsman competitions have a very different archetype that leans more towards overhead attacks and lifters, so keen to see how this robot fares against a completely different field of opponents. Until next time.